Today I want to share a quick introduction to category theory. This is an intriguing subject full of funky diagrams, but it's also ridiculously abstract and difficult. Whenever I run into it, I can feel that there are big mysteries and important connections lurking in the depths, but I always come away confused and with more questions than answers. So all I can manage here is to briefly touch on the few things that I think I do understand. I hope you will become as intrigued as I am. Category theory deserves to be talked about, and I sincerely hope that someday someone will be able to make it more accessible. So what is category theory about? Honestly, it's about everything. It seems that all of mathematics can be reformulated in the language of categories. That's exactly where all those deep connections come from. Category theory unifies all of math in a single rich language. Let's make things very concrete. I will use types as a specific example. We already talked about those in the previous video. Types are basically just sets of values with functions that take one input value and convert it into an output value. Here are two example types, the set of integers and the binary truth values, true and false. We have a function called isEven that maps even integers to true and odd ones to false. There are infinitely many functions from integers to binaries and also infinitely many in the opposite direction. We even have functions from a type to itself. The square function takes an integer and squares it. So it's an example of a function from integers to integers. Another example would be the identity function, which simply returns whatever number you give it. And you can compose these functions, so you could ask whether the square of a number is even. Now, the strange thing about category theory is that we don't want to look inside the sets. We zoom out until we no longer see their contents. Each set becomes a black box, an object without any internal structure. The only thing we know about these objects are the arrows between them. So, just to be absolutely clear, in a diagram like this one, each dot is an entire set of values not just a single one of those values. And each arrow is a function that potentially maps thousands or even infinitely many values to the elements inside the other dot. If you want to summarize category theory in a single sentence, it would go something like this. Ignore the contents of an object and only look at the arrows to other objects. Surprisingly, it turns out that this is actually enough. There is a famous theorem called the Yoneda Lemma, which shows that you can always know everything you need to know about an object by looking only at its relations with other objects. That's weird and unexpected. It would be like saying that you know everything about a person by just looking at their relationships with other people. There is definitely some truth to that, but in math it's 100% accurate. Anyway, this is what a category looks like. A bunch of objects with arrows between them. When the objects are sets, the arrows are functions between those sets. When the objects are groups, the arrows have to be group homomorphisms. So in general, you can't just draw any arrows you like. They have to satisfy certain conditions. We won't go into those here. Just know that the official term for these arrows is morphisms. So they generalize the morphisms we talk about in our videos on group theory. When I first heard the claim that you can ignore all the internal elements of a set and merely focus on its functions, I was very skeptical. I hope you are too. So it helps to look at a specific example to see how this works we will create the product of two types without saying anything about the values inside of those types. In the previous video, I explained that the product contains pairs of values. Oh, there I go, I'm already talking about values. It's just impossible not to, isn't it? 
Anyway, we saw that there are three important functions on the type of pairs. Those functions will play the role of the morphisms or arrows. First, we need a constructor function in order to create pairs. Constructors play the same role as the introduction rules we saw in proof theory. They introduce or create values for us. So the output of the constructor function is a new value of the product type. But what is its input? The function has to be given some other value from which it can produce the pair. So we have to introduce a new type to serve as the input type for the arrow. We don't know what this type is. And in fact, it can actually be any type at all. All we are allowed to talk about are the arrows between the types. But in order to make the example more concrete and digestible, let's say that this type is called person, and that it stores information about someone's name, age, weight, favorite ice cream, and so on. Somehow we have a constructor that can pull a pair out of a person, for example by storing their name and age in the pair. And then we also need two functions to extract the first and second value from the pair. Let's say that the first function returns an integer, and the second a piece of text. Those are the age and the name that are stored in the pair. These two functions act like the elimination rules in logic. They turn a pair into something else. Okay, so we have four types in total, and we already have three functions between them. But how exactly do we make it clear that the type in the middle is the product of the two types below? That's a good question. Get ready for the trick that is known in category theory as the universal property. You see, when we ask a person for his age, we get an integer. And if we first store that integer into a pair, and then extract it from the pair, we obviously want to get the same integer. In other words, we want this little triangular diagram to commute. When we follow our constructor and then the first extraction function, this should be exactly the same function as the f that goes directly from the person to his age. In category theory lingo, we say that the function f factors into the two arrows that are defined on the product type. We can do something totally similar on the other side. When you ask a person for her name, you want to get exactly the same value as if you first construct a pair that contains the name and then extract it again. The resulting diagram is the full definition for products in category theory. It defines the type in the middle as the product of the two types at the bottom, provided that we can always construct a product from some unknown and arbitrary type P. P is the person type in our example, but in the abstract definition it can be anything. Think of it as a type that somehow stores two pieces of data, like the age and name of a person, or the price and color of a piece of fruit, and then the definition says that if we can extract those two pieces of information from this mystery type, we should always be able to construct a pair that contains exactly those two pieces of information. Nothing more, nothing less. The constructor has to be unique for any given type P. There has to be one and only one way to create pairs from persons, fruits, cars, planets or other objects. This is why it's called a universal property. The amazing thing is that the diagram doesn't say anything about the values inside the types. The entire construction is reduced to objects and arrows between those objects. Okay, do you want to see something cool? Look what happens when we reverse all the arrows. This turns the definition of the product into the definition of what is known as the coproduct. It's a very common trick in category theory. Just invert all the arrows and stick the word co in front of your concepts and alakazam, you get a new concept for free. The coproduct is extremely useful. 
In fact, we have already encountered it before. It's the sum of two types. Look, you can construct a sum value from either an integer or a name. There are two constructors. See if you can explain this diagram and convince yourself that it really is a sum type. And this is what I mean when I say that category theory unifies all of mathematics. If you can, just picture yourself as a software developer. You have been asked to design a new programming language. And you've already figured out that your language needs a way of constructing pairs of values. So you realize that you need a product type. But then if you express this as a diagram in category theory, the diagram is just sitting there, pregnant with a second concept. All you have to do is invert the arrows. The math offers you the concept of sum types for free, even if you hadn't thought of it yourself. It's like a little design assistant that constantly reminds you of all the pieces you're still missing. This is what intrigues me about category theory the most. There must be so many interesting new concepts hiding inside. Okay, we are now going to move to the next level of category theory, quite literally. In your favorite programming language, you want to have not only integers, but also lists of integers. So we're going to invent the concept of lists and see how we can best model it. The type list of integers contains an empty list and lists with only a single element in them and lists of two elements and even infinitely many lists with infinitely many elements. You won't be able to store those in a real computer, but we're doing mathematics here, so infinity is just fine. Likewise, we also want to be able to store lists of truth values. So it looks like we need some new kind of constructor that can take an existing type, like integer, and turn it into a new type, like list of integer. In category theory, these type constructors are called functors. It's important to realize that I've drawn these functor arrows in a different style than the morphisms, the functions. That's because functors are not ordinary functions. The list functor does not take an integer and turn it into a list. It takes the entire integer type and turns it into a new type. It operates on the level of the types themselves. It's a function on types. This is why I said we are now at the next level of category theory. We are treating entire types as if they were values. This makes functors incredibly powerful. But there's more. We have this function called isEven. It's an ordinary function that takes an integer and tells you whether it's even or not. Our functor can take this function and transform it into a new function on lists. It turns isEven from a function that takes a single integer into a new function that runs across an entire list of integers, converts each into a binary truth value using the original isEven function, and then stores those truth values into a new list. So the functor operates not only on types, but also on arrows, on functions. It's a meta function. Of course, I'm only showing a small part of the picture here. The list functor creates many more types, such as list of persons or even list of lists of integers. You get the idea. One of the typical tricks in category theory is that you can always move yet another level up. We started from sets containing values. Step one was to ignore those values and focus on the arrows instead. Step two is functors, which map arrows to arrows. If you had to go another level up, what would be your approach? Your best guess would probably be to consider arrows between functors, right? Those are called natural transformations, and they play a huge role in category theory. But they are just the beginning. 
you can keep going up as long as you want, creating arrows between 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 arrows. No wonder category theory is so abstract. This was only a very, very short introduction to the fascinating field of category theory. I would love to make more videos about the subject, but for now it's too abstract for me to even begin to grasp. Maybe later, who knows. For those of you who want more, I have placed a few links in the description below. I would like to ask you to please like this video and subscribe if you haven't done so yet. And don't forget that you can watch our videos many months in advance on Patreon, where you also get access to exclusive content that you will never get to see here. Thanks a lot for your support, and I'll see you again soon.